new choices, new players, new models of care. You know consumer first healthcare is everywhere. For us to build the future, to see what's new, we gotta look at the world from a different point of view. Consumer innovation ain't going away. I say it's here to stay, today it leads the way. We gotta drop the silos, we're all the same team. Experience, business, tech, and marketing. So join us now, join the revolution. Consumer first health is the evolution. Status quo, or like status, no. Yeah, this is the healthcare rep. Yo, come on, let's go. Welcome back to the leading podcast about consumer innovation. I'm Jared Johnson, founder of Shift Forward Health, and here's what's going to go down today. We have the flavor of the week about the empowerment zone. Can this concept help to evolve the conversation around whether people are patients or consumers? And can this mindset help us keep our focus where it should be on improving health and wellness? I'll talk about that. Then we welcome Joel Philipson from Columbus Regional Health to spotlight consumer-centered innovation from the health system point of view. Joel helps us connect the dots between aspects of the consumer experience that can be sometimes overshadowed, but can also have a high impact on meeting the expectations of those who are receiving care. It's time to dive right in. Are you ready? Let's go. Flavor of the week. Let's give a shout out to a member of the Consumer First community for empowering us to think in a new way. I'm talking about Lonnie Hirsch and his recent LinkedIn post about the empowerment zone, a way to synthesize the conversation about whether people engaging in their health are patients or consumers. I appreciate Lonnie's take on this topic and especially his conclusion that there is a way to process what people are saying on both sides of the question, which ultimately is about where to focus and improve. To recap, Lonnie reminded us of the reasoning on both sides. Those who support the use of the word consumer feel that empowering people with information to make their own best healthcare decisions is essential because we're ultimately our own best health advocates, or we should be at least. They believe a consumer focus with more information and choice is healthy for patients as well as providers and society overall. Those who oppose using this term in any context often associate consumerism with commercialization and claim that talking about choices erodes confidence in healthcare professionals and focuses too much on money. I like that he acknowledged a few realities that it's not a binary choice. As human beings, we're complicated. We're not in the same emotional state all the time. We're definitely not in the same state of physical health all the time. So some of us may be more attentive to our health, but even that state of being is subject to change based on life experience at a given point in our journey. To that point, Lonnie identified the empowerment zone in healthcare, which is when we respect people as both patients and consumers, when they may be both at any given time and do what's in the best health interest of those individuals. Everything else is just an intellectual argument about labels, he said. I value and appreciate this kind of thinking, and it got me thinking. Maybe in 2020, we can evolve the entire patients versus consumers conversation to focus on the empowerment zone and consumer-centered innovations rather than capital C consumerism. There are lots of differences between the two, and one is that the goal of consumer innovations is to exceed the expectations of those who are working to achieve better health and wellness. Call them patients, consumers, or something else entirely. And here's a part that's sometimes missed when we only refer to consumerism. The goal is also to improve the experience of those providing those products or services. Physicians, clinicians, retailers, digital health organizations, etc. So thanks to Lonnie for empowering us with a conversation that I hope continues to get us to think differently, all for the benefit of, you know, people. Let's keep talking about the empowerment zone and be brave and respectful in the ways that we communicate about consumer-centered innovations. That's another way that we'll build the healthcare of tomorrow. And that's the flavor of the Week. All right, everyone, let's get into the flow. Please give it up for my guest this week. I'm here with Joel Philipson. He's the Director of Marketing and Well Connect at Columbus Regional Health. Joel, welcome to the Healthcare Wrap. Thanks so much, Jared. I'm glad to be here. We're going to talk about the health system point of view on consumer innovation, how you even refer to that, what does that mean. Before all that, though, let's help our listeners get to know you a little bit better. What, what would you like them to know about you and your background and help us get to know Joel a little better? Yeah, so I'm a pretty open book, but my name is Joel Philipson. I live in Columbus. Indiana. Um, I've got three kids, married, and I've been in Columbus uh, for about 17 years. I've been working at the health system for about 13 of those years. Prior to my time in healthcare, I was a photojournalist, so I worked at newspapers across the Midwest, and that was really my first love. So I worked in newspapers for a long time, and uh, I'll cherish those years for uh, the rest of my career because there's a lot of value that you get with those interactions 
of meeting people on a, on a daily basis in a variety of situations, good, bad, or indifferent. And I've taken a lot of those skills uh, to healthcare. So that's a little bit about me, but um, uh, I guess I, I lead two different teams. I lead our marketing team and uh, I've done another one called WellConnect and uh, kind of work through a variety of different projects on a daily basis, including internal and external communications, web, social, PR, brand management, signage, kind of all those things that typically happen through a marketing or advertising department. Outstanding. I did not know that about you, Joel. That that's, has to be pretty cool. I don't know if there's any anything from the photojournalism days that kind of sticks out or, or something that was particularly meaningful or impactful to you that you got to work on then. If not, totally okay. I just, just wonder if there was something that kind of stands out. You know, I, was a, I started as a, a yearbook photographer in high school. And uh, at that time, I really didn't know how to use a camera or anything. But I'm one of those photographers that uh, I wasn't so much on the technology side. It was more on the people side and the technology brought me closer to people. And I I just loved hearing people's stories and telling those stories through visuals. So as a photojournalist, you see a lot of different things. And I worked for small newspapers. I worked for medium newspapers, a couple large ones for internships. And, you know, I've covered presidential campaigns, NFL games, you know, NASCAR races, a variety of different things. But I think largely I look back at that time and just the variety of people that I, I got a chance to meet and seeing people in different stages of their life. I learned a lot of lessons from that. And and largely, it's like I can pretty much talk to anybody at any given day. So I love that. I imagine that comes into play every day in the work you're doing now. What about any career advice that comes to mind? We've been asking guests a lot. What's one of the best pieces of career advice that they've ever received? Anything come to mind there? I think career advice comes from a lot of different things. I mean, I've had the the benefit of having mentors throughout my my different careers. But um, you know, going back to the photographer part, I, early on, I had uh, a mentor say, you know, the best zoom lens is your feet. And I think that concept really rings true in many aspects of your life. You know, being up close and understanding the dynamics at play in a situation can really help you understand the context. And um, I love that that kind of analogy of like, you know, don't look from things, you know, a 20,000 foot view. Really get up there and see what, what's going on on, on that uh, dance floor, if you will, or on that uh on that project or wherever you are. And um, sometimes it's really good just to kind of understand the work at play and uh, how you can interact with that. So that's one piece. And then I had another mentor kind of give me some career advice that said, you know, at the end of the day, she asked me, did you do something to move the healthcare system forward that day? And if so, that's a good day. And I, you know, I kind of reflect on that still today, 13 years after I started and that, you know, we were kind of hit with a variety of different projects and tedious tasks sometimes that throughout the day that don't feel super value added. But at the end of the day, if you can look back and say, hey, I moved the, the health system forward a little bit, that's a good thing. So kind of keep those simplicity or those simple things in mind when I think about that kind of thing. Yeah, hey, I love that thought. I've also been asking guests how they explain what they do for a living when they're asked by somebody who, who doesn't work in healthcare. I think it's a lot easier, of, of course, to understand when we're speaking with somebody in the industry. But you know, you're at a cocktail party is one example. Something comes up, you're getting to know somebody. How do you explain what you do to them? Yeah, I think that's a, that should be a challenging question sometimes because de- depending on the day, it could be very different. But you know, healthcare systems are notoriously known for being complex and a really dynamic environment. But at least for me, it's like, I think the work that I try to do is make things appear simpler or appear to function simpler in a complex and dynamic environment. So, you know, whether that's through messaging, whether that's through a, a process flow, or whether that's working with operational leaders to make sure that we're coordinating on different things, I think giving that perception that things are maybe a little more simple than they actually appear to be on the back end is what what I, I kind of think is a large, large part of my role. Interesting. Okay, well, let's dive into that. Can you give us a, a deeper dive on your responsibilities? Like, what what is your role? How does it fit within the organization? You mentioned the two teams. Mm-hmm. What are some of those other responsibilities? I'm the director of the two teams, the marketing and the WellConnect team. I did not start in the healthcare system as a director, though. I started as a digital marketing specialist, so really working on web and video projects, that sort of thing, kind of relating to my photojournalism days. But through time, you know, I've been on the director for about six years now. And um, with that, I get a chance to work with a really talented marketing team that uh, has a a variety of different uh, projects coming through. You know, we're responsible for our overall website, our career site, our intranet sites, the web development related to that, the messaging that goes out internally and externally, and then overall brand management, you know, so everything we do from a, a health system standpoint, whether it's logo, signage, a variety of different things that are 
externally facing such as events or outreach initiatives really come through that team. So I would say there's a there's a lot packed into that. But it, if you kind of boil it down, it's really how we're projecting to the community as a whole. And what are we trying to drive from a mission, vision and value standpoint through those mediums? So and then from a WellConnect standpoint, that's a WellConnect is a, the name of one of our teams that I've had the fortunate and or I've been fortunate to be able to work with and really form have part of that formation of that team nearly 10 years ago. But WellConnect is something we've grown into more of a consumer-based department that's really responsible for scheduling primary care appointments for new patients and insurance navigation as two of the key core tenants of that that team's work. Healthcare can be really confusing, and uh, especially for people that are either new to the United States healthcare system or just in general haven't been as accustomed to how healthcare works. So our WellConnect team really looks at looks at that opportunity to meet with those people on their level, understand what their challenges are, and connects them to resources inside our health system, but also in the community to make sure that we're meeting their needs or um, finding the right resources for them. So it's been a really uh, insightful area to work in, and it's really evolved over time. But that's that's some of the, the key work from a consumer standpoint that I'm, I'm connected to uh, is through our WellConnect team. That's great. Uh, it sounds like that team kind of came up organically. Is, is that... You know, do you know the history of how it kind of formed and how it became so focused on? Like, I'm I'm intrigued by how it's focused on scheduling primary care appointments and and navigating insurance because those, those are very clearly parts of the consumer experience that can drive us crazy. <laughs> you know, like they, they can be really uh, challenging to navigate from the consumer standpoint. It, was there a history of how how that came about to be aware that that was that was something to to prioritize? I, let me, I'll start from the beginning and I'll show, kind of show the evolution of that. But uh, when we first started with WellConnect, it was really, we had an opportunity with a building in our downtown Columbus, Indiana is about a 50,000 population town in, in, uh, in Southern Indiana, kind of in the middle of a triangle of Cincinnati, Louisville, and Indianapolis. So we're the biggest health system between those three metropolitan areas, but we serve a largely rural population. That being said, we have a uh, Fortune 500 company, Cummins Incorporating, that is based in downtown Columbus. Their headquarters is here. So we have a lot of people from all over the world that were moving to Columbus to work at Cummins. And our downtown is really exploding with growth. And we really didn't have a presence from a health system downtown. So we had this building opportunity and we were like, hey, what can we put here? And that was almost as simple as the question could be is like, how can we put something here that might be meaningful to a downtown population that may not be familiar with healthcare? And so we, through a, a series of design thinking, through a series of a variety of different stakeholder interviews and research, we landed on an approach that kind of fit a model that had a role called what we call a connection specialist. And that connection specialist was really there as a resource for anybody that had questions about healthcare or anything in the community that we might be able to help guide them. And we learned a lot the first few years. And through the, the, that learning, we, we kind of landed on some um, opportunities for that role to kind of assist further. And kind of fast forwarding, we, we landed on new patient primary care appointments. We had kind of a decentralized model. We had a variety of primary care offices that handled new patient appointment scheduling differently. And this team took a centralized approach to, to kind of standardizing that. And throughout, and then a couple of years later, we really were like, well, you know, if someone's not familiar with the United States healthcare system, you know, insurance is really an important aspect of getting them acclimated to, I mean, they can't really access services appropriately without insurance in the, in the United States. So having this team um, go through insurance navigation training, they're all ship counselors and market uh, marketplace certified as well through Indiana Navigators. They can also take an unbiased approach to kind of matching them with an insurance product that's right for them. So whether that's a Medicare plan or a Medicare Advantage plan or a marketplace plan through the Affordable Care Act, we can really kind of match their needs with what they with their, what that person's looking for in a totally unbiased way. So kind of having that one-two punch of getting people insurance and then getting them into primary care, which is really the entry point for the health system so that we can best understand what their needs are from a health standpoint. That helps me understand a lot about how that would have been identified as an important aspect of the work you're doing here. So what are some of the projects and initiatives that you're working on currently? Like, What, what does it look like in terms of the keeping these programs going and growing? Yeah, within the WellConnect team, we have a lot of opportunities we're looking at. And first and foremost, we're, we're actually 
looking at moving into a brand new facility in January. We're actually converting our, our former community mall, shopping mall into a large multi-specialty clinic area and then partnering with our parks and rec department that has a, a large field house on it. So it'll be a health, wellness, and recreation facility that's in the middle of town. And our WellConnect uh, team will be front and center there to kind of assist with a variety of needs there. But uh, So that that is a hot button for that team. We'll be moving into that space and really looking forward to more community connections there. Along with that, though, you know, we've been looking at specific populations of how that team can also better serve our community. And, and Spanish-speaking populations, one that we've really been able to grow or work with that group, hired two bilingual connection specialists within our WellConnect team over the past two years. And uh, really excited about growing that because we have, we have a, I think we have a, a population that uh, we haven't traditionally been able to serve as well. And this gives us an opportunity to kind of build that trust for, for one with that population. And we've seen a lot of growth within that just from an organic standpoint of word of mouth and really excited about the work to come with specific populations, whether it's Spanish speaking, specific employers, that sort of thing. So that's some of that. Regarding the the uh, community mall transformation, we're working through that. It's a project called Nexus Park. A project that uh, I've really been working th- with is uh, that collaboration between our Parks and Rec Department and um, our, our health system to make sure it's a cohesive brand. And then also from a wayfinding standpoint, we've been doing some significant efforts uh, working with um, a variety of groups to make sure that, you know, the, the patient flow and, and really the community flow throughout the facility is a, a great experience. So we've had a lot of collaboration there. And that's that, those are some of the projects that are exciting me right now. But uh, that's a that's really a transformational project for our organization at this time. That's fantastic. I think that leads us into this concept of consumer innovation itself, right? I do feel like it goes by different names. I think consumer-centered innovation is the safe way to kind of encapsulate this whole thought of programs, services, projects, strategies that do come about as a result of identifying consumers' needs about how they experience and engage with the healthcare system and then designing around those needs so that whole concept is kind of what, what I throw into this terms of consumer-centered innovation. But I know it looks different to everybody. What does consumer-centered innovation look like to you? Consumer-centered innovation is kind of an interesting term in itself because it's a subset of innovation. And in healthcare, we like to talk about innovation, but uh, often that innovation and focus is more around the back-end business processes, such as you know making them more efficient, less cost, quicker turnarounds, etc. Those can have a lot of benefits to consumers. But when I think of your original term of consumer-centered innovation, that type of innovation really looks at what the needs are that I'm trying to solve for the consumer. And it's a totally different perspective, in my opinion. And you really kind of have to take yourself out of the health system employee mindset and really look at the experience or product or environment from a totally different viewpoint. It's not always easy and it requires kind of a variability in the approach. But I mean, some of the tools that we've used here and something that I really enjoy leveraging are human-centered design tools. And, you know, that WellConnect team that I referenced earlier is a re- really a direct example of how those tools can come to life. And uh, we've continued to kind of reevaluate with those tools over time to make sure that we're still relevant. So at Columbus Regional Health, we have, we've developed our own toolkit, an innovation catalyst toolkit that uses a lot of those human-centered design tools. But really kind of looking at a framework and how we can leverage those in multiple ways. So not every project's the right project for human-centered design tools. Sometimes you may need a, a more of a process improvement aspect or a Lean Sigma as well. Uh, aspect or a Six Sigma aspect, but human-centered design really looks at a person's perspective or a human perspective and really tries to solve around those challenges that person's looking like. And I, I really like the flexibility of the, the tools, but also the ability to work with multidisciplinary teams and also the public of bringing them in and kind of help co-design uh, different processes. Nice. Yeah, a lot of those skills feel like they make sense now. When we look back a few years ago and, and we may be like, well, you know, why haven't we always been using tools like human-centered design and design thinking and process improvement to really maximize the effect of a lot of marketing as well as other strategic initiatives. And I don't know that there's a you know true answer to that other than we're learning as we go. There's an evolution going on of understanding how these tools help and really what they're for and how we can use them. You know, At some point, we're going to be saying the same thing about generative AI tools. We're going to be learning about how they integrate with what we're already doing and unless we have to start over, 
we don't want to start over. We want to keep going and just evolving what we're doing. I know for some organizations, they are closer to that starting point in terms of they don't have a term or a word for it or a group set up, but they do want to establish consumer innovation within their teams. They want this to be a function and something that they do get going on. For organizations that are looking to set that up, any recommendations there for where they can start? Well, I think they've taken the first step of kind of acknowledging that maybe uh, healthcare in the United States is far from a perfect consumer experience. So I think acknowledging that is probably pretty key. But one of the things that I think is really helpful is is bringing in a variety of voices for input. Because the thing about human-centered design, the tools are great, but they're really a they're really something that you need other others for input and also finding willing participants. A lot of times these projects are not necessarily, you know, one meeting or two meetings type of things. It's like we, we really need someone to be committed to it. So finding those willing participants and it doesn't necessarily have to be on your specific team. I think it's maybe even better if you're branching out and finding people that have like mindedness or but bring different skills to the table. So in general, I think healthcare systems are all kind of kind of like stacked with really intelligent people, but come from a lot of different backgrounds, whether that's medical, clinical, quality, and then, you know, marketing obviously uh, has an aspect to this too. But I think being being aware that you probably want a variety of skill sets on your team because everybody can pr- kind of provide a different perspective. That's kind of my suggestion of how I might start a consumer function or team, if you will. Yeah, no, I like that because I, I think you're you're not asking somebody to throw away everything they've done. And I do think that's an important aspect here to recognize this is an evolution and it's a function that just like with any type of work we do, any new tool comes around and we learn how to use it. We don't just stop doing everything the way we've done it. We we learn how to expand, to optimize, to improve, and we go from there. Because I do feel like this whole concept of designing consumer experiences in whatever ways we can. This is what I've learned, if nothing else, from especially the last couple of years of this podcast, is that it looks and feels very different depending on the, the organization, depending on their capabilities and the people and leaders that they have in place to be able to find a starting point. So I think that's well taken in terms of where uh, where that makes sense. You know, at the same time, like this doesn't tend to be in the DNA. We refer to this a lot on the show. It doesn't tend to be something that we're naturally good at in this industry. And the reasons, you know, don't really matter. You know, it's the fact that when we are recognizing that there's a starting point, we want to get this going, we want to set up this function, or we want to do more, that that we need to add some skills or core competencies to our teams. So how do you think we can build up those consumer muscles? We have to put in some reps, if you will. We have to start getting used to working out these muscles and exercising these skills. So first and foremost, what, what skills do we need? And then how do we build those muscles? Yeah, I kind of referenced it earlier, but I think um, picking the right projects versus just any project is probably one of those those key aspects. So listening and monitoring and the ability to identify meaningful insights is pretty paramount to this. So so kind of self-selecting those projects that you think might be the best to work on versus just trying to force fit this model into it, you know, any decision. That's key because I think the best time to do these types of projects is really when you don't have a solution in mind. And oftentimes in healthcare, we like to put solutions in place. And sometimes that we have to do that. You know, there's a lot of decisions being made on a daily basis in a healthcare system. So sometimes you just need to make a decision and move on. But when we're talking about, you know, consumer experiences, oftentimes we aren't really sure what that looks like at this point. And that's where I think these tools and this This mindset can really be valuable in that let's take a look at a variety of different angles and really try to design something that's going to fit our unique organization and our unique communities or population that we're trying to serve versus trying to force fit a decision into a situation that may not be as willing to accept that. I think that being said, we we can't ignore the business processes with this work either. So, you know, whether it's cost, whether it's team setups or anything like that, we need to acknowledge that those exist. And, you know, I think that's one of the beauties of this is like, how do we put some guardrails on it, but kind of keep that scope a little more flexible so that we can design, but also just being aware of what what are the barriers we can't pass and having a good understanding of why things are the way they are can inform those barriers and that opportunity to shift or redesign, that sort of thing. Nice. I've been taking some notes there. I think that's a a really important point about not ignoring the business processes in place and, and learning how to work with them instead of trying to 
overwrite things. And I think we can all uh, probably speak to times where where that you know hasn't hasn't worked out. So one angle of this I'm intrigued about, especially with your role and responsibilities here, is what marketing's role is. So do you think marketing can play a leading role here? We're talking about consumer innovation. We're talking about some things that I always thought, I guess, when I've been in client side roles, that we were talking about the same things and we were just using different language, right? When we were talking about even things about like user experience on a website or on an online platform for scheduling or for whatever it is that we're still referring to the same things. We're trying to remove friction from an experience or we're just trying to make things easier. And now we have, you know, a, a term for it, like consumer innovation. So what's marketing's role here? And do you think it can, you know, they can help guide this effort? Well, I definitely think marketing can play a role in a leading role in consumer innovation. So I may be a bit biased, but I think we're well positioned to be a leader in this work. I mean, marketers have long been interacting with consumers in a variety of ways, telling stories of our clinical areas. I think this work really positions marketing as not just a su- support department. Like some organizations kind of put us over to the side. We're not clinical. We're not a billable department, that sort of thing. But we're, this, posi- this work really kind of incorporates like fundamental experiences of, of the organization and, and in a way different way than a support department really has traditionally functioned, but really partnering with those operational areas to drive experience and advocating for best practices regarding those experiences. At Columbus Regional Health, we're, we're actually in the initial stages. We've been working on it for about six months or so of uh, redesigning our patient experience approach. And with that approach, we're looking at kind of a consumerism and patient experience kind of team that we have some co-leads. Uh, one of the co-leads is an operational director and the other co-lead uh, is my, uh, we're looking at myself to, to lead the consumerism part, but it's a team approach that we have several people that are either positioned within those operational functions or the quality function and kind of looking at it like a consultant approach that we can, we can kind of take a look and see where areas of opportunity across the health system are and how do we lend uh, you know, our expertise in different areas that uh, we can kind of drive experiences in a different way that not only impact patient experience from a behavior standpoint, but also that consumer experience from a, from a throughput and kind of ease and convenience aspect. So we're really excited about that. We're really just kind of getting that up and running at this point, but looking at that as a, a core piece of work in 2024. I love the thought of that. I, I love that you're building on what you're already doing. This could be, it sounds like, be perceived as you know a next level, a next step. And this is a journey that you're continuing to go on. So as organizations are building up these capabilities, they're recognizing that this is a journey. At times we do want to step back and say, okay, there's there is a place we want to get to. There's a destination. So where do you hope all this work gets? Gets us as we try to make healthcare easier for consumers. How do you think that helps us as an industry and as a society? From my perspective, I'm really hoping to make healthcare a little more accessible, more affordable, potentially more relatable, and really just incorporate it into everyday lives a little a little easier. So healthcare is oftentimes accessed about two percent of people's lives. That leaves about ninety eight percent of people's lives that it's they aren't really interacting with healthcare. And I think through you know, technology or community partnerships, facility design, how are we able to reach populations we may not adequately be serving for a variety of reasons currently and kind of really transforming that to make it not so much a healthcare one size fits all, but uh, customizing our offerings for individuals without, you know, driving up costs exponentially. So I think we have to be mindful of a variety of those barriers that we talked about, but really kind of making things a little more unique to individuals, but also relatable to them so that it fits within their everyday lives. That could be involving specific populations, specific groups, specific personas, that sort of thing. But I think we have some opportunity to make things a little more relevant for individuals in their everyday lives. That's the key, isn't it? I love that phrase. I hope we keep using it in this effort. I'm figuring out how healthcare fits in their everyday lives because that's really what this comes down to. Uh, Joel, this has been very, very insightful. I love hearing about the work that's going on and I appreciate you spending some time here. In the meantime, I just want to thank you for giving us so much to think about today. If there are listeners who want to connect with you, is there a way for them to do that? Is that on LinkedIn? I, I guess that's a typical place, but is that the best yeah. place for people to connect with you? Yeah. Yeah, they can reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'll be here. That's fantastic. And that's Philipson with one one L and two P's in the middle. <laughs> it's probably the easiest way to say that's it. That's right. And an S an S E N at the end. Yes. You got it. Well, that's a wrap for this episode. I'm so 
excited that we've been able to have this conversation. I've had the pleasure of speaking with Joel Phillipson from Columbus Regional Health. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please spread the word. Tell your colleagues to tune in for all the awesomeness, then leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This show is produced by Shift Forward Health, the channel for changemakers. Subscribe to Shift Forward Health on your favorite podcast app, and you'll be subscribed to our entire library of shows. See our full lineup at shiftforwardhealth.com. One subscription, all the podcasts you need, and it's all for free. And remember, we might have a lot of work to do in healthcare, but we'll get there faster together. Thanks again.